Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in chapel today. It is the second to last week of school. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's still a little cold, though, right? But hope you guys are hanging in there. Uh, it is. Uh, it's a joy to see everybody here. Uh, Today I have the privilege of uh, announcing uh, and introducing to you, if you don't know already, uh, your SGA, your Student Government Association for the 2016-2017 academic year. Uh, just a few notes, we had over 300, about 200, 328 students participating in the election, which is about 60% more than what we've had you know, over the last decade or so. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everybody who uh, ran for election, for, to, who participated, who went around and uh, uh, encouraged everybody to vote. So just want to thank you guys so much uh, for participating and engaging in this year's election. So let me just take a moment now to introduce uh, next year's student government to you. And as I call your name, if you can uh, be sure uh, to come up. All right? All right. So the president of your student government for next year, Jindaya Campbell. And the Vice President, Mr. Godfrey Collins. Secretary is Annie Bell. And the Treasurer is Nika Bracun. Uh, the senior class rep is Rayel Ross. Uh, the sophomore class rep is DeAndre Pate. Uh, the athletics communication director is Sean Smith. All right, I think I'm going to get. And then the media director is Cheyenne Burby. And then the campus life director, Donnie Taggart. Uh, uh, awesome. Hey, let me ask you guys to just uh, be praying for them. Uh, you know, again, this is a, it's a big election. A lot of people uh, participated. But this is your student government for 2016, 2017. And my, and, and my request, my plea, my charge to them is to make Trinity better, to leave Trinity better than when they arrive. And here, here's the reality. We can't do it on our own. The staff, the faculty members, the administration, we cannot improve Trinity without their help. And here also here's the reality. They cannot do what they want to do without your help. So Trinity, I know we had an intense election, but my, my, my plea, my, my, I, I beg you, my, my prayer is for us as a school, as a community, as a student body to come together and be united as this student government seek to represent every single one of you in this next year. Amen? Yes, Man, all right, let's go. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. It is the, a joy, perhaps the, the thing that keeps me going here at Trinity, is to work with just a wonderful group of students. I think many of you have heard me say over and over again, uh, it gets really depressing over the summer and over winter break because there's like, there are like no students around. And after a couple of days of that, a couple of weeks of that, I mean, I start wondering, what am I doing here if there are no students here? So it's so good to see all of you here. It's so good to be working with each and every one of you. And today it is my um, privilege to also acknowledge the good work that has been done by this year's Student Government Association. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll hear a scripture reading from Brooke Taylor. And today's charge and benediction will be given to us uh, by Emily Snyder. Uh, Brooke served as the secretary. Uh, and... I really appreciate her because she saved me from a few weeks of 9.45 p.m. meetings. Uh, and uh, our junior class rep it was Emily Snyder, who served faithfully in that role as well. But our speaker for today is someone who you all know well. Uh, this is uh, a student who is graduating from the communications program, uh, from the honors program. She's been doing analysis on the election, comparing how the media cover both the Democratic and Republican uh, presidential candidates, which is a very timely subject. Uh, 
she has served in a variety of roles. It feels like uh, th there are no leadership roles that she could have taken that she did not partook in. Uh, she served as a, a emerging kingdom leader uh, in a, as part of that program and putting together the 360 conference. And then she served as a residence, uh, as an RA in the residence hall. And then this year, uh, as the student government president, as well as the editor-in-chief of, of the Trinity Digest. Amidst all of that, uh, she found time to date somebody. Uh, and hold a 3.97 GPA. So I don't know who gave her the A minus, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that faculty member did not get invited to her wedding. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, it's been a joy uh, to work uh, with Tiffany. Tiffany, you have uh, given steady leadership to the student government. You have welcomed me in as a newbie uh, to the Dean of Students office, and, and many, many times people will come ask me questions, and I don't really know the answer, so I just email Tiffany and say, hey, Tiffany, what does the Constitution say about this? And she's always been gracious to help me and to guide me. And truthfully, even the excitement about this year's election could not have happened uh, uh, without her. So Trini, would you just join me in giving our appreciation uh, to Tiffany and the student government for this year. Our scripture reading for today is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Please turn in your Bibles and follow along. I'll be reading from the New International, Uni Inter New International Version, the NIV easier to say it that way. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. Um, on February 25th, 2016, Fortune magazine released a news story with the headline, Millennials Think Eating Cereal is Way Too Difficult. Now, bait headline or not, I felt like this was really something I needed to read. And so here's the beginning of the article. Cereal sales are getting crushed, and there's a surprising reason why. The core issue appears to believe that millennials simply don't have the energy for the breakfast option, according to the New York Times. The newspaper reported that a survey conducted by Mintel, a global research firm, found that nearly 40% of millennials consider eating cereal inconvenient. Why? because it has to be cleaned up after eating. That statistic comes in direct contrast with baby boomers. About 40% surveyed by Mintel said the cereal was, and remains, a favorite. The cereal category is certainly shifting. Melissa Abbott, director of culinary insights for the food research firm Hartman Group, said in an interview with the Times, consumers overall are less interested in industrial produced grains as a meaningful start to their day. Now, I would say that the decline of the cereal industry is certainly newsworthy. The slow death of Tony the Tiger and Lucky the Leprechaun will no doubt affect millions of Americans everywhere. However, it does seem unnecessary to me to pin the murder of these beloved cereal characters on the millennial generation. However, countless other societal problems seem to be blamed on us every day. According to live science, millennials are the me generation, meaning that we're more self-centered than any other generation before us. Millennials are also criticized for uh, bouncing from job to job and generally being lazy. And just last week, USA Today published an article titled, Millennials, the real obstacle to a good job? You. Which is super encouraging news for all of you graduating seniors out there, I'm sure. Now what this article ended up outlining was just a few basic job hunting skills like fill out a complete application and proof proofread your resume. But for some reason this article had to be framed in such a way to insult millennials along the way. And I mean, don't get me wrong, our generation is nowhere near perfect. And it's just as unfair to pin all of our economic and social problems on the generation above us. However, it is difficult to read the news today and feel a sense of pride for our generation. It seems more and more common to be ridiculed purely by virtue of being born in the 1990s. 
And often when I'm feeling down on myself for being younger, I like to think of 1 Timothy 4.11, and I read, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. And I feel this sense of indignation, like how dare someone look down on me because I'm young and not just because I'm five foot one. <laughs> the thing is, though, that this passage doesn't say to older generations, do not look down on youth. Paul's advice to Timothy also doesn't just end with that one statement. It continues to go on and tell Timothy how to act so that he doesn't get looked down upon. And that means that in order to gain respect, we must first act in a way worthy of that respect. John Piper, author of Desiring God and countless other Christian life books, makes four general observations from this passage, which I think are really critical to understanding what it means. First, Piper notes that the, the passage means that youth can be despised, which is what the ESV translates look down upon to. Second, Piper says that in spite of this, youth should not be indifferent to what adults think. Third, Piper writes that youth should not see adult opinions as supreme. And fourth, youth should look ultimately to God's standards. Now, while Paul uses the term youth here, it's important to realize he probably isn't talking about 12-year-olds, but simply just the younger generation. You see, Paul picked up Timothy while he was uh, on his second missionary journey, which happened in Acts 16. And this letter to Timothy was written, experts say, around 14 years later. And so if we say that Timothy was in his early teens when he first left with Paul, this means he's probably somewhere in his late 20s by this time. Which, hey, isn't that conveniently applicable for the millennial generation, who are currently aged 20 to 30. And this sentiment is probably... Um, best seen, this um, looked down upon sentiment is best seen when people say things like, oh, millennials and young'uns these days with their hipster skinny jeans and their, uh, their iPhones and their political agendas. And really that sentiment isn't just isolated to what's happening today. And it's nice that Paul offers us the concession that youth can and often are looked down upon. And this has happened for centuries before, before us. Um, likely in the 1960s, people also said, oh, kids these days with their bell-bottom jeans and long hair and hippie music, which, to be fair to them, was not really a strong point in musical history. Then back in the 1920s, older people also looked down on younger people for uh, shorter dresses and short hair and their enthusiasm for women's suffrage. And I'm sure Timothy faced a similar attitude back in his day, too. I mean, people probably looked down on him for their fancy new sandals or whatever fad it was that youngins in the Roman world were going into in the day. But it is really nice that this passage offers us the concession that youth are looked down upon sometimes, and sometimes not even for good reasons. I mean, of course, we aren't perfect. Our generation probably could use a little less texting, and um, the people in the 1920s probably shouldn't have been going to speakeasies and drinking during the prohibition. But the problem comes from the fact that we often don't take advice or criticism seriously when it comes from people older than us. I mean, if my grandma tells me that I shouldn't be on my phone so much, it's kind of hard to take that as legitimate advice considering that she doesn't really understand how to use Facebook. But as John Piper said, it's important to remember that it does actually matter what those older than us think. And this is a mistake that young people make all the time. I mean, we think the opinions of those older than us don't matter at all, but they do. But in our sinful nature, we're wired to not want to listen to them. And we even grew up reading fairy tales about kids who don't listen to their parents and end up getting in trouble. I mean, take Little Red Riding Hood, for example. And OK, her mom probably isn't going to win any parenting awards for sending a little girl out into the woods alone, only armed with a basket full of bread. But she probably would have actually been OK if she had actually listened to what her mom had told her. It, she says quite explicitly in the story, don't stray off the path and don't talk to strangers. 
And what does Little Red Riding Hood do? Uh, she talks to the first stranger that she meets, who happens to be a wolf, who is obviously very hungry and carnivorous in nature, and probably wants to eat her. And then when the wolf tells her to go off the path and start looking for flowers, she does. And if it weren't for a conveniently located woodsman, she probably would not have ended up with such a happy ending, and we wouldn't read this story today to our children. All because she didn't listen to her mother. And more times than not, those older than us do know a little bit more about life. But time and time again, we really don't want to listen to our parents or older adults. Most of the time, we think we know better, and we think that it'll be fine if we touch the hot stove, because obviously two-year-old fingers must be impervious to whatever substance it is that affects our moms and dads when they touch the stove. And so we go and we touch the stove, and we end up paying the price for that. And even though those are both very trivial examples, I'm sure we can all think of things that we've done that we were encouraged not to do by those older than us. And you see, not only is it a biblical commandment to honor our parents, but it's usually just a good practice at the same time. However, it is a critically important distinction this passage, in this passage that sometimes those in charge and those older than us are not always right. I mean, chances are Timothy, having studied the scriptures and talked, talking to Paul, probably knew a little bit more about Christianity than these uh, Romans who had never heard of the subject before. And therefore, he had authority to preach the scriptures. And John Piper did warn us that it can be problematic to consider those adult opinions supreme. I mean, Timothy would have just given up the first time somebody said, oh no, I think we should worship Dionysus, and he'd be just like, okay, I suppose you're right, which would not have done much for the Christian faith. But even though there may be an issue where we disagree with those older than us, their opinions do still matter at the same time. Especially when we disagree, it's important to take the opinions of those who disagree with us into account. And for an example, I like to think of the 1960s, or this generation of young hippie folk. In any documentary you watch during that time period, it becomes very clear that not every older person really respected these 20-year-olds. In my Topics in Media Studies class last semester, we actually did watch several of these documentaries, notably one called Berkeley in the 60s. Now, while a lot of young people at Berkeley were protesting what we would consider to be important social justice issues like segregation, they were never really able to win the respect and therefore the action they were asking for from the Berkeley administration. And you see, the critical error they made was not really caring about what the opinions of those older than, than them thought. I mean, those were the older adults who were in charge. And unlike some other people of the time, like Martin Luther King Jr., who was a phenomenal rhetorical speaker and who knew how to take the opinions of those who disagreed with him into account and craft them into this beautiful, persuasive thing, they didn't really take that into account at the same time. And while they did stage a number of things like sit-ins, which is basically where you go into a building and you sit there for a really long time in order to protest something, and while that ended up being a little bit effective, uh, a lot of people ended up getting arrested because basically what they were doing was loitering, and they kind of straddled the line between being persuasive and just being really annoying. And as this movement progressed, their fights began to become even more ridiculous. Toward the end of the film that I was talking about, a bunch of students actually got together and decided that they were going to take over this plot of unused space at Berkeley and turn it into a park. Now this sounds ridiculous, but it's absolutely true. They decided that they wanted to create the People's Park, and so they brought in dirt and sod and trees and shrubbery and created this green space where people could hang out and chill in peace. Now, there's a reason why this doesn't happen more often in history, and that's because it was completely ineffective. Basically, these students had just destroyed a bunch of private property in the name of peace and only ended up angering the administration. At the heart of it, this park really had nothing to do with their social agenda, and it just ended up being a really annoying thing that a lot of students got in trouble for, and nothing positive happened because of their protest. 
And even though the people in charge at Berkeley were wrong for their discriminatory policies, the students made a huge mistake by not thinking about their opinions at all. If they had stopped and considered, uh, what do you think the administration would think? How do you think they would respond to this park? Or maybe if they had asked someone older, they would have realized what a terrible idea creating this park would have been. Or maybe they at least would have realized it wasn't going to work out. And looking back at the social issues of the 60s, we know today that segregation was so wrong. And these young people were right to reject that established cultural idea. They just didn't follow Paul's advice at the same time. And looking at Timothy here, Timothy has been entrusted to share the gospel with people. He's meant to tell people that they're sinful and take them through what God wants for them um, and then tell them that they have to accept Jesus as their savior. Of all of the important social issues that Timothy could be fighting for, he's doing the number one most important thing that he could be doing. But because Timothy is young, Paul knows that people might not listen to him. He knows that people are going to look at this 20-something-year-old and be resentful that he's calling them sinners and telling them that they're going to hell. And they're not going to want to change the way that they live their life for decades before just because some young person comes in and tells them to change. And to be fair to them, if Timothy was going around worshiping idols, lying, cheating, and stealing, and living a sinful life himself, they would really have no reason to listen to him. I mean, he would basically be a hypocrite. But you see, the second part of verse 11 is critical to the message that Paul is giving Timothy. Let no one look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Verse 12, until I come, conduct yourself or devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. You see, finally, this passage encourages young people to look to God's standards. One positive thing that characterizes the millennial generation, our generation, is that we're highly concerned about social justice issues. One study found that 74% of millennial leaders expressed some sort of desire to change the world. And you can see that easily at Trinity. I mean, for just one example, the football team partnering with Bright Hope because they see this despicable social injustice about how so many women and men are falling into the horrors of human trafficking. You see, our generation sees those sorts of things and we want to do something about it. But unfortunately, this desire to change the world is often criticized. It seems contradictory to the other claims that we're lazy or we have a hard time finding jobs because we want careers that actually matter. But this is one of the perfect places where we can adopt the advice that Paul gives Timothy. In verse 15, after Paul has told Timothy to remain faithful to God's standards, Paul says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Timothy's mission, which he was to give himself wholly to, was to spread the gospel. And we too were called to do the exact same thing, and other things along the way. We're called to spread the gospel, to speak out at injustice, to try to help the poor and the sick and the hungry. And we're called to change the world by living as salt and light. But our laziness can get in the way of that, either because of the fact that we do actually have trouble getting motivated or simply this perception that's been put on us by other people. But if we can strive to prove that stereotype wrong, and if we can try to make sure that we're living morally upright lives at the same time, those distractions can begin to go away. If we go back to the students of the 60s, it was so easy for older adults to discount the issue that they were fighting for simply because they were going about it kind of the wrong way. I mean, they were abusing drugs, they were destroying property, they were behaving illegally in a lot of different ways. And honestly, sometimes they weren't even fighting for the right reasons. They were not setting an example for other people. But we can. We can make sure that we make an effort to try so hard that no one thinks that we're lazy. We can make an effort to be other-focused to avoid criticism for being the me generation. We can follow Paul's advice and strive to set an example for others in faith and hope and love and in purity. 
not living in the way God has called us to can be a huge barrier to following God's call for our life and accomplishing the things that he wants us to do. In speech class, I remember reading in my textbook uh, that we should work on getting rid of the distracting things we can do when we're speaking. And hopefully I've done a pretty good job of this today, um, but a few things that they said that you should try to avoid are wringing your hands and swaying from side to side like you kind of have to go to the bathroom or standing in a closed off posture so that no one can really like hear you. And when I'm doing these things, it becomes really hard to actually think about what I'm saying, doesn't it? And so, for speaking, we're supposed to get rid of those sorts of things. If we plant our feet and stand very upright, and we learn to put our hands at our sides or just use them for gestures and try to put our shoulders back so that we can seem open and professional, then people will stop being distracted by those speaking habits and start focusing on what we have to say. The book said that once you've, stop, you've stopped distracting people from the message you're trying to send, people will have no choice but to listen to you. And in the same way, we have to remove from our lives the distractions that can make people discount our ability to follow God's call in our lives. If we believe that we're called to ministry, our young age can be a barrier to some people because it can seem like we aren't qualified or we can't get the job done. And people can see that you're in your 20s and begin to think that you're lazy or you must be addicted to Facebook or you probably aren't that spiritually wise because you've only been on the earth for a couple decades. However, if we can defy those stereotypes and remove the distractions of whatever they may be, being addicted to our phones or trying to work extra hard so that we don't come off as lazy, and if we genuinely try to follow God's instructions for our life, then those can no longer be distractions to others. When we set an example for others, it becomes so much harder for them to look down on us. And then we can just find the thing that we are called to do and persevere. We can spread the gospel, we can love others well, and we can do whatever it is we're called to do. We can be leaders, missionaries, and we can change the world, even if we may just seem like millennials who hate cereal. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for uh, everyone in this chapel today. I thank you for uh, the specific callings that you've given them all and for uh, the way that you've crafted them to uh, do your work in this world. Uh, I pray that as we go into the end of the semester that you would uh, protect everyone and to keep them striving to finish well. And I pray, too, that uh, for those of us going out into the workforce, that you would uh, give them the confidence to know that uh, they do have a call for their life, God, and that they can fulfill that call um, if they strive to set an example for others in faith and hope and love and in purity. And I pray that you would help us all to strive for um, your goals for that in our life. And uh, just thank you so much for uh, this opportunity that you've given us to be a part of your plan. In your name, amen. Please remain seated to receive this charge and blessing. As children of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And now, may the Lord take great delight in you. May he comfort you with his love and rejoice over you with singing. This and every day. Amen. Go in peace.